meteorologist Brittany Van Voorhees with WCNC Charlotte. Hurricane season is almost here and we already know the season is expected to be above average for a variety of reasons. We'll get to that shortly, but first we want to bring you the brand new information that just dropped. The 2024 NOAA hurricane outlook is out. Here's what it showed. These numbers, they're high, 17 to 25 named storms, 8 to 13 of those becoming hurricanes, and about 4 to 7 of those becoming major hurricanes. Now, compared to Colorado State and NC State, they're pretty much on par, but substantially higher than the average numbers of 14, 7, and 3, respectively. Now, while we know in the Carolinas and across most of the Deep South, it only takes one storm to make a bad season, this forecast is notable for two main reasons. One, the agency is predicting the second highest ACE on record. Record. This stands for accumulated cyclone energy, so it's based on the number and intensity of storms. Now it's only behind the historic 2005 season, which included Katrina, Rita and Wilma. The second, it is the highest May outlook that NOAA has ever put out. So why is it so high? The main reason is because of the change in the ENSO cycle. Now, historically, when the ocean waters over the equatorial Pacific start to return to a normal range and dip into La Nina, we have a stronger and more active hurricane season here on the Atlantic coast. Now, let's learn more about La Nina and how it controls our local hurricane season. Here's meteorologist Chris Mulcahy. Some of the most active hurricane seasons on record had one thing in common. La Nina. Let's learn more about the girl and how she affects hurricane season in this week's Weather IQ. The Enzo cycle or El Nino Southern Oscillation affects weather around the world and starts right here at the equator in the Pacific Ocean. If the average sea surface temperature based on three month increments is over 0.5 degrees Celsius warmer than normal, then we're in an active El Nino. Values under negative 0.5 Celsius are classified as La Nina. Anything in between is neutral or La Nada. Note, a neutral status can have similar effects to La Nina, which historically is bad news for the Atlantic hurricane season. During La Nina, there's more rising air in the Caribbean and around the Gulf of Mexico. This means more thunderstorms and tropical potential. This flow also supports the trade winds coming off the African coast, pushing more tropical waves into the Atlantic, which often turn into hurricanes. Wind shear, or the changing of wind direction and speed with height, hinders hurricane development. Tilting the vertically stacked cyclone will weaken it. But during La Nina, there's overall less wind shear, giving the advantage to tropical development. And the data checks out. The most active year on record was back in 2020, spawning 30 named storms, besting the historic 2005 season by two. Ball season started off neutral, but ended in a weak to moderate La Nina. 2005 was historic for Katrina alone, but it was also the strongest, producing twice the average strength, according to the measurements we call accumulated cyclone energy. Where of the 10 strongest seasons since 1950, nine out of 10 were either neutral or La Nina. And of the 10 most active seasons since 1851, six of them were you guessed it, La Nina. I'm meteorologist Chris Bulkey, urging you to be safe this hurricane season with WCNC Charlotte. Now, last year was an anomaly with El Nino, and it's still being one of the most active hurricane seasons on record. This largely had to do with significantly warm ocean water temperatures. The Atlantic Ocean, unfortunately, won't do us any favors this year either, as the waters are still alarmingly warm since they didn't cool off much from last season. This is across most of the Atlantic Basin, which encompasses the Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean Sea, and the Atlantic Ocean. Ocean waters encompass approximately 71% of the Earth. It acts as a life source for humans, animals, and deep sea creatures alike. Carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are causing global temperatures to rise, but only 10% of that excess heat influences us on land. In fact, 90% of excess heat is stored below the ocean surface. This has allowed marine heat waves to become 20 times more common. Zach Caniso is a climate coordinator and marine biologist for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. He says a marine heat wave is when the water temperature is above the 90th percentile of the average for about three to five days. But he says as our average continues to rise, so will the absolute temperature of the water. It causes stress. Just think about how you feel when it's warmer than normal, when it gets warmer. You get stressed out, you kind of feel uncomfortable. Now imagine not being able to escape that because our ocean animals sometimes can't. This warming can result in changes to coastal fisheries, migration, and circulation patterns. 
Overheating can also spark coral bleaching, which damages the coral used to support ocean life with habitat and food. Howard Diamond is the Climate Science Program Manager with NOAA's Air Resources Laboratory. He says coral reefs act as a natural defense by protecting sensitive coastlines from storm surge inundation. Coral reefs provide somewhat of a barrier for, uh, for high waves during things like hurricanes. Warming ocean waters can also result in more intense hurricanes. Storms use warm ocean water to strengthen, and warm air allows those storms to hold more moisture. Both experts say slowing down our warming oceans and mitigating the impacts of climate change is up to all of us. Knowledge is the best tool we can have to stay safe when the weather turns, especially during hurricane season. So let's do just that. Let's raise your weather IQ on the basics how hurricanes form in the first place. June 1st officially begins the 183 day hurricane season that ends on November 30th and peaks September 10th. But for them to form, conditions have to line up and the better they do, the stronger they become. Let's raise your hurricane IQ. Let's bake a hurricane. Here are the basic ingredients you need. One, a pre-existing weather pattern. Two, surface water temperatures of 80 degrees Fahrenheit or warmer. Three, a low wind shear environment and four, the atmosphere has to be juiced up with a lot of moisture. Okay, let's bake a hurricane. Over warm waters, rising moisture condenses into cold air, forming multiple thunderstorms. This flow left undisturbed will eventually start to rotate into a low pressure system due to the spin of the earth. More air rushes in and more thunderstorms release heat and power into the storm. When the circulation becomes a closed lobe with a well-defined center, the storm officially is a tropical cyclone. When maximum surface winds are 38 miles per hour or less, it'll be numbered as a tropical depression. Winds of 39 to 73 miles per hour are tropical storm strength. At this point, a storm gets a name. Once winds within a storm reach 74 miles per hour, a hurricane is born. This is the ideal structure of a hurricane. Too much wind shear will disrupt the formation. The faster these warm core storms will spin, the more likely the eye wall will form. The strength of a hurricane is measured using the Saffir Simpson scale. Category three or greater is classified as a major hurricane, causing devastating and catastrophic damage. All tropical cyclones, regardless of wind speeds, can bring an extensive amount of rainfall and flooding, especially the slower they move. The strongest hurricanes can pack winds up to 200 miles per hour, but the winds within the storm are not what push them across the ocean. That job is reserved for steering currents. A steering current is a flow that exerts strong influence on the direction of the weather system embedded within it. Hurricanes and tropical storms would just sit in the open ocean without steering currents to push them east to west. This is different from non-tropical weather systems like fronts and areas of high and low pressure. These generally move from the west to the east. The boundary that separates these winds is called the subtropical ridge of high pressure, which is located around 30 degrees north latitude. It's farther south in the winter and farther north in the summer. South of the high, trade winds blow east to west, whereas north of the ridge, the westerlies blow west to east. This is why we frequently see tropical cyclones eventually curve out to sea once they travel far enough north. Unfortunately for weather forecasters, these steering currents change constantly due to varying atmospheric weather patterns. This is one of the reasons why we track every small change in a storm, whether it's the eye of the storm jogging to the south or rapid intensification making the storm larger. These minor adjustments can cause tropical cyclones to have erratic patterns. Tropical cyclones thrive in warm ocean water due to the heat and moisture the sea provides. As a storm encounters more warmth and more fuel, it'll grow stronger and become more intense. So what can stop a tropical storm or hurricane? Wind shear, land interaction, and dry air. Number one, wind shear hurts a cyclone by shearing or ripping the top of the storm. This disrupts vertical motion and prevents the updrafts from forming a typical tall thunderstorm cloud. This happened earlier in the season with tropical storm Alex. The storm was unable to strengthen or form a closed center of circulation, causing it to look so lopsided. Number two, land interaction. This can do a number on a tropical cyclone. Land weakens a storm due to lack of moisture and heat sources. This impacts a cyclone's ability to produce storms near the center. This will eventually cause the eye to collapse and the storm to weaken or dissipate. 
Sometimes you might hear a meteorologist talk about the Caribbean mountains having a similar effect. This occurs much quicker due to the taller nature of the terrain, which disrupts the wind circulating around the low. And number three, since hurricanes are like a steam engine, sucking up all of the moisture possible, any dry air or Saharan dust will immediately halt production. Even if warm and moist ocean water is present, dry air can erode a tropical cyclone from the inside out. Another impact that's less common is upwelling from a previous hurricane. When a storm moves over that water, it pulls the colder air from the bottom of, to the top of the surface. Tropical cyclones need a water temperature of at least 79 degrees Fahrenheit. If a cyclone tried to follow in another's path, it would hit the area of colder water and just fall apart. I'm KJ Jacobs. Flooding is one of the biggest threats from a storm. Even on a sunny day, sea level rise is making high tide flooding worse. When you combine that with the power of a storm, the coastal flooding can be costly. Coastal Carolina communities are experiencing a weather phenomenon called high tide flooding. This occurs on sunny days without a storm in sight because of sea level rise. High tide flooding, which would cause problem in the streets, um, you know, disappearing shoreline during these extra high tides. Those were quite rare just 20 years ago. NOAA's oceanographer, Dr. William Sweet says, high tide flooding days are increasing. And just last year, there were six of those days recorded. Um, next year, somewhere between five and eight of those days are expected. Sweet says with another foot of sea level rise driven by climate change, high tide flooding days could reach 100 days annually by the year 2050. Emissions really matter. Higher emissions equals uh, more heating, more thermal expansion in the ocean, more melting of mountain glaciers in Antarctica and Greenland, higher seas, more flooding. Since our coastline is home to both commerce and tourism, a rising sea environment could change the landscape, resulting in billions of dollars of lost home value. With that comes a loss of beach. Um, typically in a natural environment, the beach would move inland, things would sort of readjust, the sand, the dunes, but we have stuff there. We've built uh, cities, houses, things along the coast that's just going to interfere with the uh, inland uh, encroachment, let's say, of the sea. Sweet says the first step is to plan and prepare to help protect our coastal communities most vulnerable to high tide floods. Typically, the Carolina coast sees the most flooding during the fall due to an extra foot of sea level rise that occurs naturally. It normally goes back down in the winter. However, Sweet says the trend could continue for other seasons in the future. No matter the strength, we should never underestimate any hurricane season because it only takes just one. For instance, back in 1992, that season only had seven named storms, but one was named Andrew. That's right, Hurricane Andrew. Yeah, and Hurricane Andrew was only one of four Category 5 storms to make landfall here in the United States. Wind damage and the power of wind exponentially increases as we go from category to category. So I'm literally going to show you the power of a hurricane and what it looks like on the human body. We're here at the Aerodyne Wind Tunnel, and what are we gonna do? We're gonna demonstrate the power of a hurricane's winds. We're gonna go from tropical storm one, two, three, and then max it out at a low end four at 130 miles per hour. All right, it's getting real. All right, let's experience a hurricane. This is the Aerodyne Wind Tunnel, 250 feet long, 2,500 horsepower. The main thing about this simulator, you don't have the rain, you don't have the debris. This is just showing the pure power of the winds. Okay, let's do this. This would be tropical storm strength. You can walk. Picture this as a strong thunderstorm pushing through the area. But once you get to 74 miles per hour, that's category one. Let's go category one. You can feel the difference. A category one is gonna rip off shingles, roof tiles. Let's go category two. A category two hurricane is wind at 96 to 110 miles per hour. I can't walk forward on my own. Debris is thrown into windows. I can barely speak. It's an extremely dangerous situation to be outside. Let's go major. Wrap it up in category three. You can feel the difference! You can feel the difference! Who's can be thrown off? Let's go to the map! This would be category four! 
both Category 4 and 5 hurricanes produce catastrophic damage and can leave areas uninhabitable for weeks, to even months. The power of wind increases exponentially. Just look what it does to my face as we increase the major hurricane status. Cute, right? Something I truly never want to experience in real life. But thanks to Aerodyne for showing us the force of a hurricane. I'm meteorologist Chris Mulcahy, WCC Charlotte. Again, a huge thank you to Aerodyne for actually letting us use their wind tunnels. The second time I got to do that story and it was awesome. They were only able to turn up the max to about 130 miles per hour. You can see here on our Saffir Simpson scale, that is a low end category four, which would be pretty similar to what Hugo did as it made landfall. But honestly, I could not imagine standing in a category five. What would that be like? Well, maybe one day they can up it to 157 and we'll see. But hurricane season officially starts June 1st and that goes until November 30th. However, this storm season can sometimes start early or end late, so storms can still form before and after these dates. So speaking of, here are the names, the 2024 hurricane name list. So it goes from A to W. Some letters are excluded where the names aren't as common, say at X, Y, Z. But here's the list, Alberto, Beryl, Chris, yeah. I'm back on the list. By the way, historically, Chris's have become a hurricane, but haven't really done anything. So Chris is one of the longer lasting names on this list because it recycles every six years. Ernesto, Francine, Gordon, Helene, Isaac, Joyce, Kirk, Leslie, Milton. And we have an above average forecast this year. So there's a good chance we could get through all 21 names on this list. But already as a meteorologist, I'm eyeing certain names such as Isaac or maybe Chris. Well, what's the reason? Well, historically, every single year, a storm on average will get retired. But there are some letters that have been retired far more than others and ones that we really have to look out for. Since 1954, there have been 96 hurricane names retired. But of all those names, there are some letters you especially have to look out for. Every hurricane season has a list of 21 names, excluding the letters Q, U, X, Y, and Z. When a storm causes catastrophic damage or leads to significant loss of life, its name is retired. Here are the top three retired letters. C names have been retired nine times. The first name to ever be retired was Carol, a historic category three that scraped the Carolinas and slammed New England. Camille in 1969 is one of only four category five hurricanes to make landfall in the United States. The last C name retired was Charlie back in 2004. F names have been retired 10 times. The 10th name was Fiona in 2022, devastating Puerto Rico and the worst on record for Canada. Some of the worst storm names in the history of the Carolinas started with the letter F. Fran in 1996, Floyd in 1999, and Florence in 2018 holds a bunch of rainfall and flooding records. And the most retired letter? The letter I. I names have been retired 13 times, 14 if you include IOTA, which came from the auxiliary list in 2020. 12 of those 14 have happened since the year 2000. Ian in 2022 was the costliest hurricane in Florida history. IOTA topped winds of 150 miles per hour in Louisiana back in 2021. And the list is packed with infamous names like Ike, Irene, Isabel, and Irma, which hit Florida as a category four in 2017. And some honorable mentions. D names have been retired eight times, such as Dorian in 2019. A names seven times, led by Andrew in 1992. And H and M names were retired six times, producing storms like Hugo, Harvey, Michael, and Matthew. I'm meteorologist Chris Mulcahy with WCNC Charlotte. Thanks so much for watching this mini hurricane weather IQ special from us here at WCNC Charlotte. We hope you watch our team this hurricane season, but we hope you don't see us too much. Bye everyone. Storms are on the horizon. Stay weather aware with WCNC Charlotte. From heat waves to hurricanes. It's gonna be hot, it's gonna be humid. A lot more storms and a lot more wind on the way. WCNC Charlotte keeps you informed. We also have those rain chances increasing as well. Oh my gosh, you can see it rotating. Stay ahead of the storm. Some winds even 80 miles per hour. When it comes to weather, knowledge is your best defense. See the difference only on WCNC Charlotte.